Abbott has concentrated on the short story, championed it, and made it do things that no other writer has ever done. A review in the New York Times said, the talkative men who dominate all things all at once can make this fine new collection seem as chatty as a backyard barbecue. Carried along by a swell of gregariousness, Abbott's male characters usually have a good deal to say, and they say it unapologetically. The prolific Abbott is the rare writer who doesn't feel a need to general readers into accepting his narrative idiosyncrasies. Instead, he plunges right in. All of this happened years ago, one story begins, when I was the son of a bitch, I am not now. <laughs> Many of you came to Professor Abbott's reading last night, and today's interview is an opportunity to learn how he approaches matters of craft. Dallas Allen, a first-year student, and Alyssa Capani, who is soon to graduate, are MFA fiction students, and they know firsthand the challenges of writing a story. Lee Abbott's books include Dreams of Distant Lives, Strangers in Paradise, Love is the Crooked Thing, The Heart Never Fits Its Wanting, Living After Midnight, Wet Places at Noon, and most recently, All Things All at Once, New and Selected Stories. His fiction has appeared in Harper's, The Atlantic, Best American Short Stories, and the O. Henry Bryant Stories. He has twice won fellowships from the NEA and was awarded a major arts, artist fellowship from the Ohio Arts Council. He is an emeritus distinguished professor of English at Ohio State University. In an interview at Kenyon College, Professor Abbott said he writes short stories simply because it's the thing it turns out that I can do. <laughs> Welcome, Lee Abbott. Right, I guess I'll start. Um, several of your stories take place near Roswell and hinge on the characters wrestling with the possibility that alien life has landed here on Earth. However, in the stories that don't make overt mention of Mars, we notice a motif of characters being alien to each other. And a story in particular that I'm thinking of is, is Gravity, in which the protagonist discovers some ugly and difficult hidden truths about his daughter after she runs away. Would you agree that your characters are alien to each other? And if so, is this a theme that you work with consciously? Uh, until you mentioned it, I hadn't even thought about it. <laughs> but I, you know, that's a, that's a that's a useful insight, though. So I, I won't disagree with you uh, in the main because it seems to me that even in real life, we're all aliens to one another. You know, sometimes in dramatic ways, and sometimes less so. Um, yeah, I like the notion of uh, the, the metaphor of things alien. Uh, of course, you know, I, have, I write stories. With which uh, people talk about their experiences with Martians. Uh, not that I subscribe to any of these things necessarily, but uh, I just see that as a useful way of describing how we are each by each. So yeah, yeah, good, thanks. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> in the human use of inhuman beings, a guardian angel type figure appears to the main character Billy, but this figure is a bit more sinister than we'd expect. And this leads Billy to wonder aloud to his friend, do you think anything's out there? And he's just one of your characters plagued with the possibility that what's out there could be encroaching upon our world. Um, he can also have been Martians, the narrator's friend, claims that his, faith in, that his aliens want him and he wants them, and that he mysteriously goes missing. Is it fair to say that aliens replace God in your fiction? Uh, except when they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say that, well, I was raised in Pistol Aliens. <coughs> Any other Pistol Aliens here? I like to say that we only believe in two things. Good grammar and late model automobiles. <laughs> uh, where am I going with this? Let's see. Sorry. Uh, the first story you mentioned, curiously enough, arises out of a, uh, a real experience. In 1980, I went to what was then uh, called it, uh, the National Writers' Congress. Think AWP, only with a kind of socialist bent to it. <laughs> You know, they were busy working on uh, unionization was one thing, and health insurance was another. It also happened to be the year that the Yankees, that the year that, of the strike in uh, baseball, so there was an extra layer of playoffs at the end of the year. The Yankees were involved, and they were playing the Brewers at Yankee Stadium. I grew so bored with this Congress that my friend Peter Nobler, who was then the editor of Crawdaddy Magazine, was probably most famous for writing the autobiography of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, twice. <laughs> uh, and he also wrote a book about Thomas Hollywood Henderson, 
a name that is probably more obscure. Well, certainly it's more yeah, obscure. Than yeah. So we, we, you know, I convinced uh, Peter to take me to Yankee Stadium. So we there at Yankee Stadium, the last game of the playoff, it turned out. Yankees won. I wanted to stay a little longer to see what Yankee fans are famous for doing, which is destroying the place. You know, so that was the year that they were showering Reggie Jackson with change from right field. And you could see it come down in the, in the lights, which is gorgeous. And I always thought, well, the Daily News missed an opportunity here to, you know, kind of an inside joke, because they sort of run a daily tab of how much money was thrown at Reggie. <laughs> so the Yankees fans do what they do. They start stealing the bases, right? They mob the field, steal the bases, stuff like that. And I see a guy stealing the padding from an outfield wall. <laughs> a four by eight foot pad. You know, he's going to get on the train with that, sure. Well, that night, um, we're staying. I'm staying in Peter's loft in, in Soho, and the phone rings about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I know just like that, instantaneously, that it's my wife calling from Cleveland to tell me that my father had died, and I knew that, just knew it. Now, the story, the story arises out of my attempt to understand how it is that I knew that. My father had not been ill, and there had been no warning of, of any sort, he, he moved, wouldn't think that would do it. So that, that, that's where that came from. I thought, well, it, it just has to be something whispering in my ear. You know, when, where did it come from? I don't know. You know, there's, a, there's a, probably a, a biochemical explanation for it, but I don't think in those terms anymore. It's, really, it's all about angels and Martians and <laughs> devils and people we ought to avoid. <laughs> We notice the voice of your stories is often very colloquial and, and very muscular in prose, especially the stories told in first person. Many of the stories in, in your new collection, All Things All at Once, are told in first person. We'd like to hear about your experience in developing and honing your authorial voice, and uh, could you please talk a little about your interest and your faith in the first person narration, and if possible, could you discuss if you have any issues with the third person narration? I'm asking a lot here. Yeah, it is, it is. Just go with me. You're going to have to help me here. <laughs> well, you know, it is true that Henry James called the first person point of view cheap and easy. Uh, in the main, because he said it was impossible to violate. Oh, on that count, he was wrong. If you, ever read, if you read Moby Dick very closely, you'll see that Ishmael reports things that he did not witness and were not explained to him or told to him. So it is possible to violate the first person. Uh, I've often thought that the first person point of view can be every bit as resourceful and, and, and <clears throat> rich for a writer as any form of third person. Uh, particularly if you, if you do what I call the double eye. If you, if, if you understand that there are, there are actually two first person narrators. There's the one who experiences the story and the other one who tells the story. And you can get away with a great deal of stuff by moving between those two in the course of the page. Uh, so I've got no problems with the first person. Um, but I like to complicate it by using the, that double eye motion. Um, I've been writing a lot lately in the third person, uh, if only to prove to myself that I can't. <laughs> the story last night starts off in the third person and then gets handed off. But a story in the current issue of Tin House is uh, a third-person story with three different, three different focal characters. So it's a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm just looking up for ways uh, to entertain myself. You know, I've written a lot of stuff, and my big fear, of course, is repeating myself. And, um, my, my worst, well, yes, my least generous critics will tell you that I start repeating myself in book two. <laughs> I'll sort of remind them that uh, Hemingway said you were lucky if you only had one thing to write about. I've got to my mind three or four things that, that I'm still interested in. <coughs> Boy-girl stories, uh, father-son stories, men-friend stories, and what I call my trash compactor stories, <laughs> which are sort of post-apocalyptic Walt Whitman meets Mad Max. <laughs> Very gabby things that take place in you know a ruined landscape. So now there was one other part of that. <laughs> um, do, do you do you have any issues with third person? Because you use it so rarely. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm using it more. So I'm, um, 
Taking the cure. <laughs> Whatever that is. Uh, you know, I, um, there's a lead cabinet that you would not recognize as the one sitting before you early in his career. A guy trying to learn his craft and, and consciously imitating people like John M. Dyke. Very Baroque. A writer of very Baroque prose. Um, and then, well, years ago there was a symposium in Harper's Magazine in which they asked me to participate. Well, the subject was, what, what does it mean to be a Southern writer? And I had to explain to them that if these things mattered, and I don't think they do, I'm not a Southern writer, I'm a Southwestern writer, it's a difference. <laughs> but what, but responding to that symposium gave me the opportunity to sort of figure out where I'd come from. And uh, I don't know that this happened uh, instantaneously or in scene even, uh, but there came a point where I understood that the only thing, the only thing I really knew was you know, several hundred square miles of the American desert. And the only way I knew it was in the language that had come to me, all the things that were important, first love, first death, the, all the great firsts, in this case, first sex, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> in a language that even now still strikes me as peculiar to that part of the world. And, uh, I knew if I were going to, I was smart enough to understand that if I was going to be faithful to uh, the thing I thought I most understood, <clears throat> and if I was going to be honest about the way in which I understood it, then I ought to embrace the, the, the English that comes from that part of the world. So there we are. That was not bad. <laughs> totally bullshit. <laughs> um, so I like that you um, you say you talk about the boy girl stories. You write the boy girl stories because okay. we also have noticed uh, that your characters are often struggling with romantic difficulties, marital difficulties, mm -hmm. infidelities. Mm -hmm. So do you see yourself? Um, well, I guess you do see yourself working at this as a theme. But how do you keep this theme fresh? Do you have any advice for us as we try to embark on similar? Mm. What is it William Styron says in uh, Light Out in Darkness? They should have never put the idea of love in the mind of an animal. <laughs> the man was right. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in romantic love because, uh, it, you know, it's inherently dramatic, isn't it? I mean, even, even now, I've been married 42 years, even now, you know, it's, it remains <laughs> it's every bit as complicated and interesting and uh, and et cetera, as, um, as it did early on. It, it's, it's just like gunplay, but without the guns. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just, I, you know, I'm, inter I'm interested in the creatures we are. Yeah, I'm interested in the stories we tell ourselves to explain why we're doing the bad things that we're doing. So. I'm available at sixty-five dollars an hour. <laughs> Help me work through these problems. <laughs> I'll send you some of my manuscripts. There we go. <laughs> well, I mean, I've been asked God, because of these stories. I've been asked, well, how many times you've been married? Because they must they imagine that that all I'm doing is sort of you know, writing autobiography or, or personal history or something like that. No, I'm not. Well, there's some things that, of course, immediately occasion a fiction. Like, I remember when our oldest boy fell in love for the first time, this is the eighth grade, right? <laughs> With a, a young lady that we didn't care for very much, and we saw through her immediately. <laughs> After soccer season was over, she dubbed Noel for a hockey player. <laughs> and Noel took it badly, as you must. You know, the point of first love is to hurt you deeply and permanently. <laughs> so he, you know, he, he mooned, he, he moped, he, he sulked, he, he went in his room and brooded. You know, and what I wanted to do was, was to tell him, you know, you, one, you'll survive this, and, and then two, I would tell him my story, Carol Bashaw. And said, stay out. Don't, don't get mixed up with this. So I wrote a story in which a father witnesses his son's first love come crashing down around him and consoles the son with his own story of first love. And, uh, and this is the only time I ever subjected myself to this sort of censorship, but I said, I won't publish it unless no one approves of it. So I give it to him, you know, anxious as we all are when he gives somebody a manuscript, right? He 
goes upstairs and says, the bedroom comes down a few minutes later. He says, ah, it's one of your better ones, Dad. <laughs> Everybody's a critic, you know? <laughs> Even the people who live with them. <laughs> I was mentioning, I, I, did I, I mentioned the, the, this broken bone of my life's last night, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. So nothing. There's, gonna, there's no more physical Pam on the page anymore. <laughs> I'm having to go to the internet porn to find it. Probably body parts. I just need a second for that one. Yeah, I know the good sides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. We notice a mix of humor and heartache in your stories. Do you see yourself as a writer of humor, or as a uh, humor just a tool to accentuate the drama? Of the piece? I'm not. I'm not afraid of uh, good yuck on the page. I'm, I'm pretty impatient with those people who are uh, earnest at the expense of everything else, and, and those people who are just silly at the expense of everything else. But I, but I cannot imagine. Get him an hour into the day without a good <clears throat> chuckle or something. I'm just a guy who appreciates how, how absurd things are and, and, and understands it to be part of the human drama somehow. I, I published an essay a couple of years ago called, well, at one point it was called The 17 Things About the Contemporary Short Story That Really Hacked Me Off. <laughs> but for the purposes of this essay, it became The 13 Things About the <laughs> And one of them was my belief that. Writing funny is, is sort of discouraged. Uh, you know, you're not taken seriously until you're a serious writer. And I, I've never understood that sentiment, but you can certainly see it. You know, in, I saw it in my workshops all the time, unless, unless it was, you know, oh God, serious and grave didn't count as uh, you know, something literary. And I disagree. But you can count the truly funny people on the fingers of one hand, I think. I'll start with Woody Allen, in a book of his called Without Feathers, if you know that book. It's got the world's greatest uh, story there called a, a Brief History of Organized Crime, and it's two pages long. And it's written like the begat pages in the Bible, with all those great names, you know, Three Finger Louie begats. You know. <laughs> But then, of course, there's a great story, uh, the Google Mass episode, which is, you know, Madame Bovary comes to contemporary New York City, courtesy of a history professor. Um, but, you know, who else? P Peter DeVries was one. He was a funny guy. Um, Kurt Vonnegut was funny. But, you know, pretty soon you run out of, out of folks who uh, had made you know, terrific reputations out of tickling in the funny book. I, I don't know why that is. Well, you know, my people have a <coughs> have an appreciation for irony, and then not the self-important irony, but situational irony. <coughs> so all of a sudden, it got very serious. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Great crack a joke. <laughs> we noticed that there are several characters who recur throughout your mm. stories. And this gave us the impression that your stories work together to build a world that your readers can visit. Absolutely. So, how does this affect your writing process? If you could talk a little bit about creating that world. So. Well, the, the way it is now, the world's been created. All I have to do is sort of remind myself of where Del Cruz's Triangle Drive is. You know, and, you know, and every one of my stories, people play golf at the same place, they bank at the same place, they get their gas at the same place, they take their chicken fried steak at the same place, you know, it's all done. You know, they know where the interstate is, they know who owns the Ramada Inn, blah, blah, blah. So I, I actually don't have to think about that anymore. But you're right to see these seven books as a kind <coughs> of history of, of my Yakna Patapa County. You know, it's, Deming, New Mexico actually exists, and I did live there for six weeks one summer with my best friend. He worked at Buzz King's Chevron Station, and I worked in a cotton fields with a kid named Ears. <laughs> and that's where the, that's where the truth stops. You know, <laughs> the facts stop. You know, we had an apartment on Olive Street. That all is true. But of course, shaping that world, reinventing it, uh, sculpting it somehow is just a way of, of, of just a way that I can talk about 
things that happened in Las Cruces, in El Gordo, and Viadoso, and Albuquerque, and Santa Fe, and Fayetteville, and L.A., and San Diego, and stuff like that. I just, but it's, you know, I understand that landscape. <clears throat> I, know, I know what those clouds look like. I know the names of the plants you know, and the animals. I had a poet teacher when I was an undergraduate named Keith Wilson. Any poets in the room? Keith was the biggest bullshitter I've ever seen. <laughs> but he did say some smart things on occasion, and one of them was a writer shouldn't learn the names of the plants and animals in the places he or she wants to write about. You know, you've, got, you've got to evoke things. How do you evoke things? Through specificity, through detail, you know, through the facts of the place, even if it's, you know, at bottom an imagined place. So where am I? Process. So I don't have to do any work. I just have to remember what I did before. Everybody banks at the same place, the Farmers and Merchants Bank. I know where the gum is underneath the conference table. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess kind of going off that last point, um, you, you talk about, you know, you know New Mexico, that that's, that's you know, where your fiction has always been, but you've lived in other places like Arkansas and Ohio, and how have these places uh, with the exception of one story, uh, I don't think I've ever written about Ohio. <laughs> and I have written a little bit about Arkansas because um, well, I, yeah. Um, I don't know actually know why, but um, the things I've come to understand is that you know, there are parts of the world that are too green and too flat. And you know, Ohio is both those things. Uh, there are no vistas. You can't see. I mean, I go home tomorrow and I'll sit on my patio and I can see 20 miles down the valley that way. And I could see 20 miles that way if there were a couple of mountains in the way. This is, you know, this, that's the world I live in. The one that's constantly reminding me of how insignificant I am. It's terrific. Uh, but I don't get green. I don't get lots of water. I don't get uh, snow. Winter is a puzzle to me. Um, I'm very simple-minded that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't know what, what to say beyond that except um, I've never found anything compelling in the landscapes. I, mean, I, I recognize beautiful settings, don't get me wrong. I can be a tourist too, but uh, they just don't speak to me. Those landscapes just do not speak to me in ways that you know, the high desert does. We were coming back from San Diego last week, uh, out there celebrating my birthday with uh, our younger son and his family, uh, they have two boys, both of whom are Libra babies, too. So we were listening to, I don't know why I'm telling the story, but we were listening to uh, a book on tape, or on disc, actually, called The Last Gunfight, story of the OK Corral. It's a kind of cultural history of, of what, made that what, what made that gunfight inevitable, beyond the fact that you, know, you had gunslingers. Uh, things like politics, things like economics, particularly boom towns, things like uh, you know, rivalries between the northerners and southerners who migrated to that part of the world. Well, as it happened, we finished the book about the time that we were rolling into Benson, Arizona, and 25 miles south of that is Tombstone. <laughs> so we went to Tombstone, where I can tell you that it's a very, you know, it's an old-fashioned kind of movie set western town. Everything about it looks contrived, but it's not. It's, you know, it's been reconstructed in a way that is supposed to be as it was once upon a time. But on every commemorative plaque, this is why you should never be an English teacher, on every commemorative plaque, and there are plenty of them, they have mistaken IT apostrophe S for high TS. Don't be crazy. <laughs> Don't be crazy enough that we drove on then to Disney. I've never been to any of these places. And then to Douglas, Arizona, where I ran across my old buddy Pancho Villa again. We went to, there's a famous hotel there called the Gadsden Hotel. 
the first floor, which is marble of a number of varieties. I mean, big sweeping staircase to the second floor like this. The chips in which are supposedly put there by Pancho Villa riding his horse up to the second floor. And I'd written my, my MFA thesis as a, as a novel, part of a novel, uh, written under the influence of too much uh, Garcia Marquez. The features Blackjack Pershing, Ambrose Beers, and Pancho Villa on the occasion of the punitive expedition into Mexico to track down Pancho Villa after he invades Columbus, New Mexico in 1960. And I saw it then as I, uh, I'm going on too long about this, but so my old friend Pancho Villa shows up again. You know, I wonder <laughs> when I was a kid, my parents were great drinkers. <laughs> and in those days, there were four ports of entry you could use, three in El Paso and one in Columbus, New Mexico. You could bring one-fifth per adult back per month, but in those days there were no computers, so they would just go to the, they, three different weekends. They'd go to El Paso, cross over to Juarez, get their booze and come back. And then the fourth one, we'd always go to Columbus, New Mexico, so that would be about 90 miles away. It's right across the border from Las Palomas, Old Mexico. But you have to pass by this place where there's a monument to the, the Pancho Villa coming into the country and shooting things up. My father would drive by there and say, you can't look at those. Those are the actual bullet holes. Now, can you imagine what this does to a kid like me? <laughs> you know, out of such things come the necessity to tell a story. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, to uh, switch tracks just a little bit, you have a question on process. Okay. How do you know if your story is finished, and conversely, at what point do you abandon the story? Okay, here's some really practical advice about the former. Years ago, I was giving a reading in uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and my host was Lynn Barrett, who now teaches at Florida International University. So there's the reading, and there's the party afterward, and then there's Lynn and me sitting at our kitchen table, you know, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning or something like that. And me saying, God, I can't do anything worth shit. And then she gave me what I have since come to believe is the best advice I've ever gotten with respect to endings. And it's, it is this, I share it with you. Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> she says, cut the last of everything. Cut the last sentence. If that doesn't work, cut the last paragraph. If that doesn't work, cut the last page. If that doesn't work, cut the last crot. She's right. Because I think we have a tendency to, to want to hang around and make sure our readers get it. And so we're constantly, re, we're, in, in other words, we're, we're writing and writing afresh and writing still anew that ending. And it works. Absolutely works. Free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> now, <clears throat> When I start a story, I know what I want to do first and trust myself to find out what, I'm going, what needs to be done second. Uh, and if I don't know, if, I, if, if I've done the first thing and I'm still in doubt about the second, I just don't go for it. I'm, I'm one of those people who's uh, really afraid to screw up. <laughs> 